Welcome to everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, yeah, so this session uh, hosted by Kyle, who I'll introduce in just a minute, from the Farm Labs medical team uh, about some basics of, of medical models um, and 3D printing and, and how, to, how to get that workflow into, integrated into, into your work. Um, cool, let me pop to the next slide here. So, uh, while, while Kyle's doing his presentation, um, please don't hesitate to put questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we don't have any polls on this one, so feel free to ignore, uh, ignore that stuff for this presentation. Um, also, if you want to ask us questions, I'll be putting some links into the, the Zoom chat window as well um, during the presentation. Feel free to ask quick questions there too. Uh, and then lastly here, um, I'd encourage everyone, um, we may have a few minutes at the end for questions. That being said, if we don't, um, this thread, uh, the link here at the bottom of the screen um, is a discussion thread on our forums specifically for this session. So if we don't get to your questions, um, I wanna make sure you get them answered. So please come to this th uh, link. I'll make sure I throw it into chat a few times during the presentation, including at the end, so you have it. Um, so you can go to that thread, join our forums. It's a great place to learn about form labs, learn from other users, all that kind of stuff. We encourage you to, to join us and join the conversation there. Um, and then, yeah, in a couple of days or so, we'll either have Kyle or someone else from the healthcare team who can answer your questions, hop in and, and provide some answers, which will be really great. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna hide my screen and I'll pass it over to Kyle. Hey, Dan, thank you. Uh, just confirming real quick, you can hear me, Dan? Yes. All right, all good. Hi, everyone, um, welcome, thank you for coming. I'm going to share my screen here real quick, go over some, a few slides, and then we're gonna hop right into the demo. So again, hello, uh, my name is Kyle. I'm from the Form Labs medical team, and today I'm going to be presenting some advanced post-processing techniques for medical models. The goal of the webinar is to give you some basic tips using simple steps to produce some more advanced models. Um, we want to break it down into basically the easiest way possible for you to integrate our printers with a little bit of extra processes after the prints are done to make beautiful, colorful anatomical models. We're gonna cover dyeing and painting models to highlight regions of interest and ways that you can slice your models so you, that you can create a single print um, using multiple parts to have a model made out of different materials, a single model made out of different colors. And these are really just ideas to get your creative juices flowing. So some of the stuff that we're going to be looking at are a little bit uh, more simplified, but once you understand the basics, you can go ahead and create, you know, some of the anatomical models that you see here in front of you. So a little bit of background first, um, why are we, you know, producing this webinar? So medical professionals are turning to 3D printing anatomical models for educational purposes, preoperative planning, surgical guides, and even medical devices. It's really important in these anatomical models to highlight certain regions of interest like tumors, blood vessels, organs, etc. Um, and although stereolithography, the printing method that the Form 2 and the Form 3 use, has its limitations when it comes to multicolor or multi-material models, there are some methods that you can adopt, hopefully after this webinar, to create these types of models. So let's go through the workflow here real quickly, just from scan to 3D printed model. Depending on the desired tissue that will be printed, the patient will have a CT scan or an MRI. Um, usually the slice thickness that you want to create a good 3D model will be around one millimeter. If you have a larger slice thickness in your imaging, then you're going to have a printed file that has lots of larger layer lines. So you always wanna make sure that you're starting out with good scan, good quality data to produce that DICOM image. That's the file that comes from the CT or the MRI. Once the DIC, you have the DICOM um, file associated with that scan, you will start the segmentation. There's a couple different ways that you can do segmentation, either automatically using software um, or manually, where you are choosing the region of interest in every single slice um, of that image to group either a bone from the entire model, 
an organ from the model, a vessel, you know, whatever region of interest you are trying to produce. Depending on the accuracy of that scan, that will give you, uh, that will translate over into the accuracy, the dimensional accuracy and the surface detail of that print. So later on, we're gonna be covering making drainage holes, slicing models, smoothing your models. Um, so some really basic design tips from the model that you get from your segmentation, some steps that you can take to open it up, um, to add some features that will increase the printability of that model. We'll look at this model specifically um, and how I produced a model that I'm gonna show you in a second that's made out of two different materials in two different colors. Then we'll talk, our, and we're gonna open it up by talking specifically about coloring the models. We have four different methods that we're going to cover here today. Um, we're gonna to cover dyeing resin, dyeing models, painting models, and painting hollow models. These are all pictures of the examples that you see there um, over on the side. So that being said, we're going to hop right into the demonstration. So first we're going to cover dyeing the resin itself. If you wanna produce a model that is in an opaque color, we have the color kit that is for that. So this is going to be covering creating translucent models when you want to produce them with a color to highlight a certain region of interest. So the model that I was discussing before, it's a model that you can see here. Let me zoom in on this real quick, give me one sec. This model that you can see here is a model of a heart that I printed. Half of the model is in our elastic material the other half is in our clear material that I dyed. Using magnets, you're able to create a single model highlighting either a specific region of interest with color or a separate region of interest with a different material. So, if you want to dye the resin, you'd be using a full liter of our clear material and 10 milliliters of alcohol ink. I will be going into a lot of specifics here. Like I said, this information will be made public. Um, we're creating a blog post that will be released very soon, so make sure you look out for that. All of the data that I'm going to be talking about today, the procedures, they're going to be highlighted in that post. Also, this is being recorded, so you can always watch this demonstration again if need be. So, to create dyed resin, you would just need one liter of that clear material and 10 milliliters of alcohol ink of your desired color. You would then open the cap to that cartridge, pour in the 10 milliliters of the alcohol ink, shake that cartridge up for a couple of minutes, and then proceed as you normally would with any clear print in your printer. Set up your job in preform and clear, wash your part as if it were a clear part, cure your part as if it were a clear part as well. That is how I created the side of this heart. This was clear material with blue ink. And as you can see here, we have the other half of that same heart using clear material with red ink. I'm just going to jump in really, really fast. Um, if yeah. anyone, I just noticed on my screen, if all three windows are the same size, my picture and Thomas and you, um, if you hit speaker view in the top right of your Zoom window, that will expand Kyle's picture to be the whole screen, just in case anyone was curious. Anyway, carry on. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. So um, as you notice with this model here, obviously the support structures are the same color as the model, right? Because all of the material that you're using is being used up in this printer. So the pro of using this to create colored clear models would be that there is no real cleanup afterwards. You dye the resin, you go ahead and print as you normally would, everything is the same. One downside to using this method would be that the material, um, the excess material on the part when you're using the form wash, 
you risk some of that dye then coming out in the IPA of your farm wash and possibly tainting um, other parts that you would then be washing in the future that were not using that same colored dye. The use cases that you would use this for would be, like I said, any type of region of interest that you were trying to produce that can be separated from the main model that you have. If you're printing a single blood vessel, a single tumor that you would like to <clears throat> add to the model, um, either with magnets or with glue, this is a nice way of producing translucent models in our clear material. The next method that we're gonna talk about is dyeing the actual models themselves. So we'll do a nice quick live demonstration of that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to be dyeing elastic and clear parts for you. I'll show you how quickly they can be dyed and how effective this method is at coloring your parts. So what I have here is just the Form, um, form Labs finish kit. Inside I have two liters of IPA in each bucket and 20 milliliters of that same alcohol ink. So that ratio of one milliliter of ink to 100 milliliters of IPA. Again, I wanted to make this as simple as possible. Um, I don't need you going out and buying all, the, all of these artistic supplies. So IPA you should readily have on hand. The alcohol ink, a couple of dollars from your local um, craft store. I have some clear parts here. I have a sphere that we'll use as a control, one for each color. I have a blue bucket and a red bucket here. Get myself back on screen, sorry about that. And I have a couple implants. You can see here, this is an implant on the front of this patient's skull. We're gonna be dyeing this same implant in the material. So you can go ahead and lower in the sphere, the implant, and I have this elastic um, elastic model here that is of an aneurysm. I'm going to lower that into the blue material, the blue dye and IPA. I will take the bowl, the implant, and the red, and I will lower that into the red mixture that we have. While I talk about this, we'll let that go ahead and sit and I will pull that up in about five minutes and we'll take a look at how effective that is. So dyeing your models after they're printed as opposed to using the material will save you any excess material that you don't want to be printed in that specific color. If you're using the material here to dye your models, you have to use up an entire liter of that now red clear resin that you have. If you only need to print a few objects and you don't need a full liter, this would be a better method for you to use. Simply dipping your parts inside of the material afterwards or even dipping specific regions of interest. If you only wanted to dye a particular part of the model, you could simply lower that into the solution here for about 10 minutes. You'll see here, we'll pull it out after five. Um, and you can also use different concentrations. So you can do one to 100 milliliters, one to 50 milliliters, if you want different saturations. Very, very simple method that we have here. We're gonna go over painting. And once we're done painting, we'll pull those models out and see how those looked. Kai, were those pre or post cure? Great question. So these are pre-cure. The elastic, the clear, everything is pre-cure. Once the models are, um, I'll go ahead and show you, you let them dry off on a paper towel. Once they're done, you would go ahead and cure them afterwards. They're not able to absorb as much of the IPA and that dye um, if it is done after the cure. And the curing actually results in no color loss whatsoever. So the color that you see when you pull it out is going to be the color that remains throughout the cure cycle. Thanks, Dan. So now we're gonna talk about painting models here real quick. 
the paint that we recommend, like I said again, just so it's nice and simple, we don't need you to get any kind of primer. Adding a primer to the models could result in loss of detail. So just make sure you're getting a multi-material acrylic paint. Regular acrylic paint is used for porous materials like wood or canvas. It's not going to stick as well to our material as this multi-material paint does. So using this multi-material paint, you're able to paint on using one coat and get beautiful differentiation across your prints. The model that we have here is the bottom of a patient's skull, their spine with these blood vessels here painted in red. So your artistic ability is going to be really the only limiting factor in painting your models, but it can be easily done with paint brushes. You can use tape to tape off regions that you don't want paint. You can use airbrushes or spray paint, um, all of them as effective as the last. And again, you only need to buy the colors that you need of paint in multi-material acrylic paint. This is going to be most effective when you're producing models that have lots of parts that you are not able to either simply put together or specific regions that are small enough where you wouldn't want to print that out to dye it. So lots of applications can be used for painting as well. This is for external surfaces, as you can see here. Sometimes if you're printing something that has an internal region of interest that you are not able to get to with that painting method that we just talked about, there is a way that you can get that paint onto the inner surfaces of your models. So using that same paint, multi-material acrylic paint, you're able to produce a model that looks like this. This is a kidney, and as you can see, as I rotate it around, this blue region of interest here is actually on the inside of this clear model. If you're trying to highlight a tumor on the inside of a model, a blood vessel on the inside of the model, I know that this specific use case, there was a tumor on the inside of the kidney, so they highlighted the tumor and they highlighted the renal artery um, as well. So they were able to see where the blood vessels were in relationship to the tumor to have a better idea of preoperative planning before they went in to remove that tumor. The way that you would produce a model like this is you would have to, using your CAD software, hollow out that region of interest whether it's the blood vessel or the tumor on the inside of that larger um, anatomical model. You would then use that paint, use a syringe with a, um, you know, a sharper tip at the end. If you're using a needle, um, you would need to most likely dilute your paint solution with water since it is acrylic paint. But we found that simply using a pipette or one of these syringes the model here has two holes so that you can introduce the paint into the model, shake up the model on the inside, allow any excess paint to drain, following the instructions of whichever paint you dry for, or whichever paint you buy for how long it needs to dry. And then moving forward, um, you could plug up the holes either with some excess resin and cure it afterwards, or you can leave it open if that's fine for the um, particular model that you're using. So, like I said, a lot of what we're looking at here are very, very simple models, simple paint jobs on these, but once you understand how you can, um, what you can do with these models, I expect that you can create these beautiful models um, that we presented a little bit earlier. So, that color, that covers the coloring portion of the webinar. I know, like I said, it was a lot of information. It was really quick. This information will be made publicly available 
soon. Next, we're going to jump into some design aspects real quick so that you can produce, like I said, a model, multi-material, multi-color models. How is this possible? We have a few more examples here of some models. This is another heart that you can see. Let me just zoom in. If you want to access the interior regions to look at the aspects that the doctor wanted to see, we have, again, magnets in multiple parts of the model. So th this is actually three pieces that are all put together to make a single model. Really small magnets. I bought a couple hundred of them um, on the internet for around $10. So you could produce a lot of models using very few resources. Before we get into that, let me just pop these dyed models out real quick. Kyle, I've got a quick question while you're doing that about the painting, if that's okay. Yeah. So someone asked, um, have you tried dyeing the IPA with the color kit dyes? Just out of curiosity. Uh, no, I have not. And that's because the kit has, well, the color kit is for opaque models um, as well. So it's not going to work with the translucent um, materials that we're using here. And it also has a photopolymer in it. So it could affect the way that the, uh, that the is working if you dip your models into it. Um, and that could, you know, if there's a light, it could actually attach itself. Um, that material could attach itself to your model. So I didn't Got use it. the color kit. All I've been using is this. Um, Cool. And the only other question that we had here on painting was for acrylic painting, uh, pre or post cure? Post cure. Yeah. So once, once the model is completely done, you would want to go ahead and post cure that. And again, a lot of the um, painting that we do is with the standard resins, um, painting on white, painting on clear, on gray. If you're looking to paint with the elastic material, you'd have to find specific kind of paint that is not going to chip and flake when that object is bent. This is why I recommend actually um, this methodology for elastic material. Um, if you have been printing an elastic, you might know that it, it is a little bit more difficult just because of the physics of um, stereolithography and printing that dyeing your material, I don't recommend dyeing the material for elastic. We want elastic to be as simple as possible. We don't want to introduce anything into the material itself while the print is happening. So if you want to produce dyed elastic models, I suggest using the IPA and alcohol ink dip. And I'm going to show you right now just how good those look. Thanks. Yep. I'll hold them out in front of the camera. So, with that drain, here you can see one of the blue models. That was the elastic material. Here's that clear skull implant that we have now dyed blue. Here's that clear sphere that we had as well. Let me pull out the red. Red's a little bit more vibrant than the blue. Here's that elastic material now dyed red. That same implant that you saw earlier and the sphere that we used as the control object. So as you can see, not a lot of time fairly simple. The only thing you really have to worry about there is the cleanup at the end. You make sure you don't want to get any dye on any of the surfaces like I just did here in this room. Okay. 
So I'm going to go back and share my screen. We're going to be looking at some simple design tips, like I said, to show you how I created these more advanced anatomical models. The program that you see here is called Mesh Mixer, completely free. Um, and because of that, you know, some of the design features are a little limiting, but you can still produce high quality models using their simple tools. So first, let me just make sure that I'm going over all the steps in the right order. So the first thing that you're going to want to do when you bring in a model from segmentation there's probably going to be a lot of noise that you have and you want to clean up that model. You want to take away anything that you don't need to be printed. It's going to save you time and it's going to save you money on material. So I'm going to go through this all, like I said, fairly quickly. If you miss some steps, you can always go back. We can watch the video again um, to pick up on what I taught you. So select any regions. Let's say, you know, I don't need this particular part of the model. You can go through and select anything that you don't need. You would then go ahead and discard that part of the model that you see there. So something as simple as that um, can be done around the model to clean up any of that excess noise that you have from the scan. For this purpose, I'm just going to leave the model together. And let's say that I was told that the physician wants to see this model of the patient's heart and wants access into the atria and the ventricles. They want to see the inside of this model. You can go ahead and use their plain cut feature. Draw a line. I just do it in between the logo and the word form labs there. And it gives you a nice visualization of what you'll see after this model has been sliced. So to me, that looks great. I don't want to just cut that side off, right? We want to keep both parts of the model. So I'll go ahead and slice down the middle of that model there. I will then create separate shells of that model. So now we have two different parts. This won't move out of my way. So now you can see we have these two separate shells. I'm just going to view one shell that we have here. So now we have half of the heart and we want to add in those holes so that we can place those small magnets inside so that we can create multicolor or multi-material models. By dragging in the cylinder, you can then adjust the dimensions of that cylinder for the size that you want depending on the size of the magnet that you have. You can change the location of where that is, and it's going to stay in the plane of that model there. So let's say I wanted to just make this two millimeter hole, leaving room, of course, for any kind of fit issues that you have. So now you have this, imagine that this will be a negative space. We will remove it from the rest of the model. It is a new object. We'll accept it. And we want to delete this from the rest of the model, but we want to do it in the same spot on both halves of this heart. So I'm going to go ahead and duplicate that dropped part in. I will now select both. We're still looking at the other copy. 
And as you can see here, we have now gotten rid of that region where we can now place the magnet. You can reproduce this same, these same steps in different areas of the heart so that you can have multiple magnets to have a better, um, a better hold between these two parts. And what we're going to do now is take a look at the other half of the model that you see here. And as you can see, we have that duplicated cylinder. We would go ahead, Boolean difference those. And now we have same size hole in the exact same position. You're able to then export these models to preform once you've done all of the techniques and post-processing steps that you would like to see. Another feature that you might want to use, depending on the slice thickness that you have, I'm going to use these blood vessels as an example here. Let's say you have really bad layer lines because of the scan data from the MRI, the CT scan, and you want to smooth out those rough edges. You can always go in, select the region that you would like to see smoothed out, use the smoothing tool, and as you can see here, those veins that had all that, all that feature, all that detail, once we smoothed it out, you can see how effective that could be in, in turning any kind of rough edges that you have on your part into a much smoother area. So we've added holes for the magnets. We've smoothed out any of the rough edges that we don't need to see. You can delete any of those regions that you don't need to be printed. And the last thing for those of you who are familiar with 3D printing on our machines, you want to add drainage holes into any part that could be printed like a suction cup into any hollow cavities that you have. As you can see, looking at the bottom of the model here, we have a couple drainage holes already in place. But let's say you're going to print the model on the side and you would like to put a drainage hole right where my cursor is here. Mesh Mixer also has the ability to add a tube. You would place one end of the tube on that surface, the other end of the tube as close as you can on the back. You can adjust the size of the tube as well. Once you hit accept, you will now notice this small hole that we have here going straight through the model. That will just increase your printability for any models that you have that have these hollow areas on the inside. So those are the quick design tips um, that I wanted to run through. We cleaned the model up, we smoothed it out, sliced it up into pieces, and then added some holes for magnets and added some drainage holes to increase the printability. Once you've done this, you want to bring that model into preform. And I know that elastic is like I said, one of the trickier materials to print with. We're gonna cover some quick preform um, tips that we have for printing anatomical models, and then we'll go right into your questions. So, for the sake of time, I'm not going to add supports. Um, we can imagine how the support structures look on these models. If you wanted to print these models out, you always want the supports to be on the side that is not the region of interest that you um, that you're hoping to get that maximum definition. So on the inside of this model here, like we said, the physician wants to see the inside of the model. You would want to have the object 
be printed with the region of interest away from the build platform to avoid having to remove supports from that particular region of interest. If we were printing this in elastic, you could theoretically fit both of these models onto the build platform, like you see here. I could go ahead and click add supports and send this over to the printer. One of the um, specifications that exists for elastic material is you want to print the elastic material as close to the build platform as possible. The longer the support structures, are the harder it is for the print to come out successfully because since the support structures are made out of that same elastic material you can imagine they don't provide um, that good of support the longer those support structures are because they are also prone to bending and moving so as you can see here we could fit both of these models on the specifications that we have for elastic is you you want to try to keep supports under 20 millimeters. You can see that if we were to support this side of the model here, we're already at layer 293. So we've gone over those specifications for elastic material. So you want to keep in mind that when you're printing with elastic, just because you can, doesn't mean you should fit that many models onto the build platform. If I were to print this model, like I said, you want the model to be as close to the build platform as possible. You want to reduce the height of those support touch points. A lot of the times, depending on the organic shape of your model, you know, it's going to be difficult to print um, in the elastic material because of the specifications. But Following these steps, it will increase the overall printability. Add supports, upload this model directly to your printer, which is, this is the exact same way that I um, focused my model. Once you have your model oriented in this way, you don't have to worry about removing any of the supports from the inside where those regions of interest are. One more thing. If for some reason, the region of interest that you had for this model was on the outside and you were okay with having supports on the inside, but you still want those holes for the magnets. You can go ahead, sorry, I did that a little quickly. You can go ahead over here to our support structures on the side, go to edit. That will show you every single touch point that you have here in the model. And you wanna just zoom in on those holes that you already made for the magnets. You want those holes to be support free so you don't have any issues putting the magnets in. You can go ahead and click on existing supports to remove them and add supports away from those holes just to make it easier for you once you are doing that post-processing. Once those supports are away from your regions of interest and exactly how you want them, you can go ahead and hit apply. And now your part is set to upload to the printer. I see we have a lot of stuff going on in chat, probably a lot of questions as well. Um, again, I wanna say thanks to everyone for listening, for paying attention. Again, very simple procedures that we have here that you were able to take, you know, the, the sky's the limit on this stuff for how you want to slice up your models, color them, paint them. These are just a few steps to get you started um, and get you pushed into that direction. Dan, um, let's look into, into questions. Yeah. So we get answered. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it. That was, that was great. Really informative. Yeah, the discussion going on in chat is about kind of alternatives to Mesh Mixer. Some people have better luck with other things. And um, yeah, good good chat going on in there. Um, so someone asked, uh, does Preform understand that you're printing an elastic and optimize layout and orientation to it? I don't think it does, but you might know better than me on that one. Uh, you're correct, Dan. So when you select the material, Preform will send all of those over to the printer so that the printer is 
tuned in for printing in elastic. The only thing that's going to be specific as far as preform goes, with the setup is the support structures, the density and the touch point size is all going to be dependent on the material that you use. So here, let me, let me just share my screen again here real quick. We can look at preform. So with elastic, because of its um, ability to kind of tear off of the supports, the touch point size is 0.7 millimeters, which is pretty high when you compare it to some of our standard resins like clear or gray. Yeah. Um, as far as orientation goes, I have manually orient all of the parts that I have. Um, and I, I would expect that a lot of people do the same because preform is not going to know, you know, do we want the outside to have supports? Do we want the, or the inside to have supports? You know, they don't know what your specific regions of interest are. So I recommend just um, following the orientation steps or tips that you know already and doing that before you add the supports. Got it. Uh, we have two questions on magnets. Um, mm -hmm. One is, um, what's the best kind of uh, glue adhesive you found? And two, um, how do you sort of dial in the tolerance you need to, to stick a magnet in there when you're modeling in mesh mixer or whatever? Gotcha. Great questions. Um, I use super glue and I found that that's pretty effective in elastic and our clear material as well. Um, it is going to be a little bit with the elastic material. Um, so sometimes I've just taken a little bit of sandpaper, scratched around the inside of the hole, add a little bit of surface area. Um, if you're looking for something stronger that will bond more to the elastic, um, you could use something like, I believe E6000 is, is a good epoxy um, that I use in other things that I build. Um, so any kind of epoxy, but yeah, I found that super glue uh, works great. That's what I did in this model that you see here. And as far as the tolerances, um, I believe these are five millimeter magnets. Um, are the ones that I bought. And so for the size of the hole, I just made it 5.1 millimeters. No real science or anything to it. I just like so I know I'd be able to put the magnet in there. Awesome. Uh, next one, you might've covered this, but I might've missed it. Um, someone just asked about internal supports uh, as an option in preform. Uh, okay. I think is a great uh, uh, thing to bring up. At least, you know, hey, I don't want to have to pull supports out of the inside of this thing. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. Let me, I'll, I'll go back into preform here real quick. I know it's hard to show without uh, doing the support, supporting, but. <laughs> right. No, it's, it's a great question. Um, I do it when I print in an elastic all the time because it is hard to remove those. Inside. So if you are printing, let's say you're printing this model in elastic, you can go ahead and as you see here on the left-hand side under the support tool tab, you have internal supports. If you, uh, and, and sorry, let's, well, let's define what is an internal support. So an external support is a support that goes from, maybe we have some here with, on this model. So an external support is a support that goes from the support raft to the part itself. So all these supports that you see here are all external supports. Luckily, we have an internal support here I zoom in on. Internal means it goes from part to part. So it doesn't touch the build raft. If I was to turn off these internal supports, this support here would disappear. And you can see when we look inside of the heart here, we also see some internal supports just holding up the vessel wall. If I was to turn this off and auto generate those supports, all those internal supports would disappear and you would either be left with some red blushing which is um, indicative of the fact that there should be some supports on the inside so preform is always going when you have this internal supports checked on you know preform is optimizing for that particular part it is creating all the supports necessary so that you get a nice successful print if you are removing internal supports you do run the risk of the print failing um, but that being said I have printed many elastic hearts and I delete internal supports pretty often. If the red blushing is extreme, then I'll add some. 
you know, the, you're, you're going to have to do some post-processing anyways. Um, but our print can handle um, a lot of, you know, a lot of stress. So don't worry about seeing which method is going to work best for your part. There could be some trial and error. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something that you'll, you'll need to find out for the, the size and the, you know, the shape of the parts that you're printing. Yeah. And I think that the blushing and the learning curve of preform are great things to bring up in that a, the blushing is not a guarantee that a part will fail in that place. And also as you learn preform, you can sort of learn, yeah, it's telling me it's blushing there, but I, I know what I'm doing and I know that it'll be fine if I don't put a support in that exact spot or whatever. Right. Um, uh, I got two quick questions here, which I think I can just get through really fast. Um, Roberto asks, um, hey guys, do you have any recommendations for a list of free software um, for segmentation and 3D design? Um, there's been some discussion here um, and Kyle mentioned Mesh Mixer as well. Um, I'll also say we are currently in the process of putting together a really easy to parse resource for a bunch of um, CAD software, uh, both free and not. Um, so keep an eye on our resource pages for that. It's, it's something we definitely understand that people want to know what software to use. Um, and then I also saw someone ask, um, do you have to do the models by hand or are, are there programs that can turn CT or MRI data into 3D models? Um, that totally exists. Kyle, you might have a better idea of what those programs are. Yeah. Um, so there are definitely free slicing um, or segmentation software out there. Um, I don't want to recommend any particular, you know, software. The free ones obviously are going to be done manually. So you're going to be going through every single um, slice and you're going to be selecting that region of interest uh, for you. That's the manual way. It takes a lot longer, um, but, you know, that's what you get with the, with the free models. With the more expensive software, they have, you know, they've run these segmentation, these like DICOM data through uh, machine learning. And a lot of those for simple models, um, like a spot are done completely automatically. And there are companies out there that exist. So um, if you, you know, depending on the size of your print farm, the lab that you're working in, the hospital, um, there are different ways that you can go about approaching creating these anatomical models. So if you have the imaging software, you can get the DICOMs and then you can find companies that will do the segmentation for you and they'll send you back the STL, which you can then upload into preform and print yourself. Um, so that's, you know, that's one method that some people use if they don't have people on hand that can do the segmentation. There are still methods available for you to get these uh, models printed out. Yeah. Um, Zara asks, can you explain a little more about touch point size? Um, that's a great question. Um, a lot of it comes down to variables like the size of your model, literally the weight that your model will end up being because the touch point is what's holding the model to the support during printing. Um, also material, as Kyle mentioned, uh, elastic is a little more of a, uh, a tricky printing process because it's stretchy. So you want a larger touch point, but on, uh, so he said like 0.7, I think that's a really good starting point. For our standard resins, I think you can get to like 0.3 to 0.6 without breaking a sweat, depending on the geometry. But yeah, feel free to get into it more, Kyle. Yeah, um, so I just zoomed in on it here in preform. What Dan said is all correct. Um, the touch point size is, it's the diameter of the support where it meets the model. So elastic, you know, when the tank and the build platform are separating from each other, you run the risk of the of there being some tearing in the model itself because you know this material is a lot more delicate um, because of its ability. So you want larger support touch points to prevent any of that tearing from happening. You can on if you're printing in clear, like you're printing this heart in clear, um, and said it really just depends on the size of the model. Preformed differentiate between the size of your model and the size of the touch point. So if you were to create, you know, this heart model in elastic at this size, it would still be 0.7 millimeters, same as if you printed the heart model in this size here. It would still be 0.7. So it really is up to you, like I said, to find that sweet spot um, for printing the specific kind of models that you're printing. 
there will be some trial and error to it. The default settings that Preform have are gonna be great for beginning users. Uh, they are maximized for printability. Once you have a good workflow set up in place, then you can start tinkering with some of these things, internal supports, adding your own, changing the touch point size. You can even change the touch point size for a particular. Um, so let's say you wanted to delete this one and you wanted to add in one in that region that was just 0.4. You'll notice it's actually, you know, you can see that it's smaller than the ones around it. So you can manually add in supports of certain sizes um, as well. I don't want to get too into the weeds on, on supports, but yeah. No, it's a great point to bring up, definitely. Um, uh, just had one. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, Kyle and I both have experience on the FormLab services team and we can both say confidently, if you're not sure what to, a touch point size is, definitely reach out to them uh, with a, a picture and STL of your model um, that we can take a look at. And we're more than happy to give you recommendations based on our experience looking at, looking at models. Um, and I'll also say, just in case we're, I think we're about to close out, um, I just dropped a link into our, uh, into the chat. Um, this is a forum thread specifically for this uh, session. So if we don't get to your question, please uh, jump in there, um, join our forum. We don't spam people who are members. Um, it's a great community of people who are trying cool stuff. Um, definitely ask us questions there and we'll get back to them. Um, Tim asked a great question. I don't even know if this is possible. Uh, maybe this will be our last one for the day. Uh, how would you recommend making translucent sections of anatomical models using post-processing techniques? So I assume that means some opaque sections and some translucent sections. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, and I don't have the model with me. Uh, I sent this model away to uh, one of our medical conferences. So um, let me... Yeah, if you want to find a picture, Kyle, go for it. Um, yeah. You've got one around. Yeah. Um, recommendations, just while you're going, Kyle, I can get into this one. Recommendations for cleaning uh, elastic, it's tricky. Um, sanding, obviously, is a, is a tougher thing with a squishy material. So I would say you're going to want to use uh, like flush cutters and get really as close to the, the actual model as you can. Um, and then, yeah, smoothing from there is, is tough. Uh, again, that's one I would probably send off to our support team with a picture of your model and your question and they'd be happy to take a closer look and give you some um, post-processing recommendations for elastic. Um, yeah, Dan, and elastic also one uh, tip that you might not find on our support page for processing those supports off of elastic material. If you freeze the material, um, it will be mm -hmm. more rigid and easier for you to Yeah, I have a picture though of a, a partly translucent print that I did. Just my computer. And Gerardo is asking, can we scan models in elastic material with ultrasound imaging? Um, Gerardo, I'm not sure if you mean scanning the uh, a a thing to make into an elastic model or scanning an already printed elastic model. Um, I assume if the elastic model fits in an ultrasonic scanner, that would work fine. Uh, there's no reason it would it would not catch um that scanning method i don't believe and if he's asking more about um, like the radio density of the material i do not i don't think that elastic shows up um, in, in imaging in certain imaging softwares um, but oh okay then i'm wrong okay that's great to know cool here's um here's a picture of a part that was pretty um just something real quick to show um you know something that was asked in that question. I wanted to create a model where you're able to see through into these different colored um, hex of the brain. So we have the brains made out of elastic material. I did those in the alcohol ink, uh, one side in red, one side in blue, I then printed the skull cap in clear. And I simply used a clear coat spray finish um, after it was done printing. So I did a little bit of sanding to remove some of the support um, bumps off of there, but I did not sand this down, you know, to gloss. And obviously the quality of the um, file that you're using 
is going to, you know, the number of polygons, et cetera, is going to determine the, the overall finish. But yeah, I just clear coat and I was able to produce some semi-translucent models. All of this, you know, exact same way that I showed you in uh, Mesh Mixer. Did I? Dan, are you muted? Oh yeah, I am. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, John asks in, uh, in or said in chat, uh, you could use a soldering iron or wood burning kit to melt off support touch points. Um, I can't officially endorse that <laughs> method, but please try that and let us know how that goes because we'd be very curious. Um, but cool. Uh, thank you so much. I already saw someone just jumped into the, that forum thread and asked a question. So maybe in a week or so, Kyle wouldn't mind jumping through that forum thread and just uh, touching on a few of those questions to get some responses in. Um, but yeah, Kyle, thank you so much for your time. Thank you everyone for, for sticking around and watching. Hopefully this was helpful. Uh, feel free to reach out to Form Labs in general with any more of these questions. And yeah, this was, this was really great. Appreciate your time. Yeah, one, one last thing real quick before everyone leaves. Um, we will have a survey going out to our medical users soon. That's just some technical questions so that we can create um, you know, better products for you here. So look out for that. And thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Stay safe and healthy out there. We'll uh, we'll see you soon.